Hello and welcome to the Princeton Spine and Joint Center podcast. My name is Zinovi Mailer and I'm the co-director of the Interventional Spine Program here at Princeton Spine and Joint Center. We just finished uh, recording a podcast with Dr. Simon Hanft. Dr. Hanft is a neurosurgeon with extremely varied background. I'm going to tell you right away that this was a really varied conversation, a very well in-depth conversation that ranged from spine tumors, the way they present, what type of spine tumors exist in general scope, what type of treatments uh, Dr. Hanft employs for those uh, tumors. Also, how he diagnoses, how he approaches a patient that may need surgery or may not need surgery. We also talked about the different aspects of non-oncological surgeries. So how does someone with minimally invasive uh, therapeutic background approach some of the more common degenerative entities like spinal stenosis and uh, herniated disc and what type of surgeries are available and what's on the horizon in the surgical world. At the same time, we also talked about when it's appropriate not to do surgery and also some of the other uh, considerations which were very interesting to talk to a surgeon about when we dive into psychosomatics and, and personality types and also even, even talking about the, the nature of medicine in US and how the mentality it may be somewhat different from, from Europe perhaps. So this is an in-depth, wide-ranging, long, but very rewarding conversation with an expert in the field who has tremendous background, and I think that you will enjoy it. Hello, and welcome to the Princeton Spine and Joint Center podcast. My name is Zinovi Mailer, and I'm the co-director of the Interventional Spine Program here at Princeton Spine and Joint Center. And today joining me is Dr. Simon Hanft. Dr. Hanft is a neurosurgeon at Rutgers Center, uh, Cancer Institute of New Jersey. He is a director of minimally invasive brain tumor surgery and a surgical director for pituitary tumor program. Dr. Hanft, I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. Thank you for joining me and welcome to the podcast. Happy to be here. Appreciate the invitation. So today, uh, what I was hoping to do is talk to you a bit about and really tap into your extensive background and knowledge about two major topics. One mm -hmm. is spine tumors, and the other one is taking your expertise of minimally invasive therapies for intricate tumors mm -hmm. and taking that to more common entities of the spine, mm -hmm. spinal stenosis, disc herniations, etc. Right? Absolutely, yeah. So, um, before we dive into the meat of the matter, if you will, mm -hmm. um, it's, I think it's important, but I also th think that it's very difficult to uh, overlook and not to mention your uh, impressive background, right? So, let me just run through it very quickly, and please correct me if I get any of these wrong. I'm sure, no problem. <laughs> All right, yeah. so, um, you received your undergraduate bachelor's degree from Yale University, Right. Yes, yes. What was your what was your focus? There? I was an English major, cool. actually. Yeah. Interesting. So. And then you had uh, you received a master's degree from University. Um, what was this? Cambridge. University of Cambridge yes. in England. Yes. And what did you study there? Also, uh, English, uh, a particular period of time in the history of English literature, okay. basically the Romantic period, kind of late seventeen hundreds. Good, good really. place to, to yeah, study yeah, that, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So then you went to Stanford University, where you received your uh, your medical degree. Yes. And while at Stanford, you were a recipient of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Fellowship Award for Research, right? Yeah, we had research. The research was basically involved with neural stem cells, which remains a hot area, and you know how they responded to, to brain insult, injury, that kind of thing. Right, and that, that's a very selective uh, selective fellowship, uh, a selective uh, award to receive. Yeah, it, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's you know, it's a it's a fairly rigorous application process. Um, they hand out a good number, uh, but. You know, probably in our medical school, there were maybe a couple people who got it every year. Kind well, of. Well, I think it's. I, I think that it's about seventy in the whole country yeah, across yeah. the the top universities. Yeah. Doing, doing research. You know more about it than I. Do. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I looked into it just yeah, because yeah, yeah. it's a highly selective yeah. uh, award. Um, then you went on to do your neurosurgery residency at Neurological Institute at Columbia University. Yes. Right, and uh, and that's where we kind of chronologically crossed paths a bit. Right. Uh, I did my residency at New York Presbyterian, and I can tell you that 
in my experience, your service, your neurosurgical service has been one of the, one of the most impressive services at the hospital. Yeah. Um, one of the things that was completely mind blowing is, is the number of calls you would receive. Whenever a resident from your service would come to consult on the patient while having a conversation, the pager would stay quiet maybe for a minute. I mean, the, the number of you're cases- You're bringing back bad memories. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> but I'm sure that, yeah. the, I mean, you, you're talking about Neurologic Institute of, yeah. of New York, where majority of the more complicated uh, esoteric um, cases were brought in. And sure. so your experience and your exposure must have been uh, must have been tremendous. Yeah, it's but, a great aspect of the training. Exactly what you said. I mean, you see complicated stuff, a lot of variety, um, and so yeah, it's 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 that's what's built into a place like that when you go to a place that uh, you know provides you that kind of exposure. So for those that uh, for the listeners that don't know, how long is the residency for your seven years? Okay, but you didn't stop there. You went you went on to a neuro oncology fellowship at the University of Miami, right? Right, and your focus there was on uh, on minimally invasive therapies for. Yeah, I mean, overwhelmingly it was uh, brain tumors. We mm -hmm. do, we we did have some spine tumors that we addressed there, which I'm sure we'll touch on later. But um, but yeah, it was mainly brain tumor surgery, minimally invasive approaches, but but also uh, not just um, uh, how to operate, but also. Uh, clinical trials, therapies beyond just surgery for brain tumors. Right, right. Awesome. So yeah. that's why I wanted to go over it because because you have extensive background yeah, and sure. this is what we're, we're what I'm hoping to tap into so that you can shed some light on some of the things. So yeah, absolutely. let's dive into spine tumors. Yes. I think the easiest way to start talking about this is to to kind of take an example, right? Mm -hmm. So um, some of the common things that that we see here in our practice is of course we deal with pain. So most of the times patients will come in here with pain and a lot of times it's pain that's stemming from the spine. Mm -hmm. And of course, the primary concern is how do we get this pain under control, right? right. But very close to that second thought is where's this pain coming from? Right. And a lot of the times in the back in the back of their minds, they're asking a question of, do I have a tumor? Mm -hmm. Is this coming from some kind of cancer? And sometimes it's not in the background, yeah. sometimes it's very much in the forefront. Sure. And there are different reasons why people may start thinking that, you know, some people heard their neighbor say it, some people saw it on TV, some people have family history of something completely unrelated. And now it's, it's, it's in their mind that this may be the case. Right. So how would you, how, how do you look at cases like this and mm -hmm. how do you, what makes you think more, more tumor versus a more common source of the pain yeah. from the spine? Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, these tumors can, you know, just the general category of, of spine tumor uh, is broad. And I, I probably would uh, segment it into two basic entities. Uh, one would be uh, tumors that involve uh, the spinal column, mm -hmm. uh, really the bony uh, elements of the spine. So the vertebral bodies, uh, the posterior elements, which include the joints, that kind of thing. And usually when you're talking about uh, tumors in that domain, uh, they're overwhelmingly tumors that spread there. So metastatic disease that go preferentially will go to the bone. Um, and more often than not will cause pain in the back itself. Mm -hmm. um, if it's progressed, it can compress the nerve elements, the nerve roots, the spinal cord, and then cause some radiating pain as well. And so that's well within the the way these present, both with pain in the actual region of uh, where they spread and also um, based on the neurologic compression. Um, but there also are primary bone tumors as well, which are a little bit more exotic, uh, some of which can be aggressive, a lot of which are not. Um, and then you have an, another category, w which I would characterize as tumors within the spinal canal. Um, also can be referred to as intradural tumors, mm -hmm. uh, tumors that are arising from uh, elements within the, the spinal canal. And so sometimes within the spinal cord itself and sometimes next to adjacent to the spinal cord, perhaps arising from a nerve root or from the lining of the canal. Mm -hmm. um, and when they get to a certain size, it can cause compression of the neural elements, the spinal cord and or the nerve roots and create pain. Those tumors tend not to create so much pain in the, in the back or the neck 
um, as much as they cause problems with radiating pain, pain radiating down the arm, pain radiating down the leg, and also associated with numbness and weakness. Mm -hmm. So those are the three really basic neurologic elements that we're taking stock of in these mm -hmm. patients. Mm -hmm pain, strength, and sensation uh, can be boiled down to that. So, you know, these are fairly exotic entities. Um, you know, I do uh, probably the most of those operations in New Jersey, and I'm still doing about one to two of those a month. Mm -hmm. So it's a very high number for that area, but um, it's still relatively rare. Um, interestingly, and I'm talking about tumors in the spinal canal, metastatic tumors, unfortunately, are more common than primary tumors from, from the canal. Interestingly, I get a good portion of those tumors from physicians like yourself, because in the workup of patients who present with the symptoms that you describe, pain in and around the back, the neck, or radiating pain, uh, oftentimes an MRI gets ordered, and that's mm -hmm. how these things get found. These are imaging-based diagnoses um, when they ultimately come to me for that. Um, but obviously, when you're on the front lines more like yourself, you're encountering patients really from the beginning who have these symptoms and who've had minimal to no workup, and sometimes they've had some workup before they get to you. Oftentimes, you'll be the one ordering that MRI if you're suspicious for there being something, not necessarily tumor, could obviously be that, but it might be just something more garden variety and degenerative. And that's how a lot of these get uncovered. Um, but they are more rare, obviously, compared to the wear and tear degenerative uh, problems that people have. There's there's one one element of, of symptom in patient's history that in in our training that kind of came up and I don't know if you see that or if you see any validity to that yeah. um, of nighttime pain mm -hmm. and actually seeing pain that wakes somebody up several hours after they go they go to bed and of course the thought there is that the vascular bed changes and yeah. as as they lie down horizontally and, yeah. Yeah, what you described is right. I mean, it's a kind of a it's kind of part of the classic questionnaire, and I think you see it pretty routinely. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it's obviously something that's distinguished from when someone is active and right. putting pressure on the joints. And but it depends. I mean, even in metastatic disease, similar to a degenerative problem, if something's kind of eroding the joints and the disc and the bone, that's activated also just by, you know, by, by, by your daily activities. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting distinction to make. Sadly, a lot of those, I mean, for me, a lot of those distinctions that can be made in the history and physical fall away because we're so MRI dependent. Right, right. So, but for clinicians like yourself, that can probably, in a lot of circumstances, motivate you to get an MRI sooner rather than giving a patient months of treatment before ultimately getting the MRI. So right. there's a lot of relevance to what you described, I think, for the clinicians who are encountering these patients on the front line. I'm not seeing patients. A patient with leg pain or back pain is not jumping to the neurosurgeon, though amazingly it'll happen. Right. Um, you know, at minimum, these patients need to have an MRI. Um, before they get in the door to see a specialist, right? Um, and I think most patients understand that. Yeah, a lot. A lot of times, it's like you said. It is. It is more about when do we start that that initial fight with the insurance of yeah, get, right. getting the approval for the MRI right, that's what before, it is. or do you wait wait out the you know prerequisite by the insurance of a number of weeks of conservative care, right. ultimate conservative care, and uh, before going for for imaging study. Um, in patients that you see and that have a diagnosed tumor, mm -hmm. let's yeah. just let's just kind of be be very general in that. Uh, what red flags do you look for? I mean, yeah. what what would make you more concerned in patients like this? Uh, you're saying preoperatively yes. in my assessment. Yeah. Um, so much of it again is imaging based. I mean, it would it, there are characteristics of these tumors on MRI um, that you know, would nudge me in the direction of thinking something's a little bit more aggressive as mm -hmm. opposed to being benign. Fortunately, tumors in the spinal canal are almost all uniformly benign. Mm -hmm. um, schwannomas, meningiomas characterize the overwhelming majority. You can, you can see malignant processes in that region, but it's uncommon. It's when something is involving the bone itself that the suspicion then turns towards uh, a more aggressive process. So, um, so much is really dictated by the imaging. Mm -hmm. um, things that are involving the bone, 
um, can be very safely and effectively biopsied on an outpatient basis, not by me, okay. typically by an interventional radiologist. Mm -hmm. It's something that, that doesn't even need to be ordered necessarily by a neurosurgeon. It could be ordered by yourself, a primer, if they see something like that. Uh, and that obviously can establish diagnosis with a high degree of, of, of accuracy and, and success. Um, however, tumors in the spinal canal are not typically biopsied. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, there are various parameters that would indicate, you know, that, that, uh, that drive us uh, in the direction of recommending an operation. Symptoms, uh, patient's age and health. Uh, size of the mass, degree of neural compression, meaning how the spinal cord and the nerve roots are involved. Um, there are quite a few patients that I see where this is an incidental discovery, mm -hmm. where a patient might have back pain, ultimately gets an MRI, and they have a tumor that's, that's not causing the back pain. I had one recently uh, like that. But in that case, we did actually elect to proceed with surgery based on how young the patient was, how large the tumor was, and it was probably just a matter of time before she was going to become more symptomatic from mm -hmm. it. Um, and it's always hard to say whether or not the symptoms are truly from the problem until after you do the operation. And then you see if there's symptom resolution. Mm -hmm. um, I hope that characterizes, you know, I hope that helps to characterize it a little bit more. But, you know, in the end, we just were, were we, could, we could glean a lot from what the MRI shows. Got it, got it. And so let's say for, for in respect to aggressive or, or malignant, yeah. let's say schwannoma, right? Yeah. So something that, that is relatively, not something that you would jump on doing yeah. something surgical for, yeah. right? Um, but it is something that is that, that develops within a confined space of a, exactly. of, of a bony canal. Yeah. At which point do you start to consider, I mean, is it progression of symptoms? Is yeah. it, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's not a common thing to expand or start compressing the nerve. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, usually you, you could definitely have these, like I just said, that are incidental, that mm -hmm. someone has someone has a fall and their back's hurting them and they get an MRI and the back pain goes away and lo and behold, there's a tumor. Right, so right. the key is, uh, as with really anything in the world of medicine, you want to, or really the world of surgery, I should say, you want to be able to link the symptoms to the problem. So I think it's simple in that if someone has symptoms mm -hmm. that are referable to a mass, um, a schwannoma being a common mass in that region, then I think the surgical decision-making is relatively easy. Um, it becomes a little bit trickier, and I've encountered this if someone's 88 years old and they have a bad heart, they're on three blood thinners, you know, it could become a little bit more uh, fraught with risk. And so the decision making can therefore become a little bit uh, more, more convoluted. But um, if someone has clear symptoms and there's, an, and there's a mass, that the decision to offer surgery is relatively straightforward. Now, if they have like I described, questionable symptoms or no symptoms in incidental finding, that could be trickier. And then in that situation, you might elect to, which I have many patients I do, where we just order a surveillance MRI, mm -hmm. typically on an annual basis because the growth rate of these masses is is low. I think mm. it's probably a few millimeters a year. Okay. And so um, then in the setting of growth, um, we feel more valid, validated in recommending an operation because the idea is that the tumor will continue to grow. Okay. Um, there are certainly cases where the tumor grows and then stops, but that's not usually the way it works. Mm -hmm. Usually these grow and continue to grow. So you basically um, you extrapolate and you say yeah, that eventually yeah. this will cause symptoms. Right, then. and you don't want it to necessarily cause symptoms, especially if we're talking something around the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. The nerve roots have a lot more resiliency, but if you talk about something around the spinal cord, sometimes those symptoms are not reversible, mm -hmm. um, especially as you get a little bit older. So we might uh, lean towards being a little bit more proactive in certain circumstances. In someone who's a little older? It depends a little. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it's, you know, it's a balance. Of course, of course. You know, sometimes in the older patients, you're a little hesitant because they might have medical issues. So it's, it's you know, you got to factor in a few things. But fortunately, it's relatively straightforward in that most of these things are found in the setting of symptoms. Mm -hmm. You know, I do have some incidentals for sure, but a lot of times there are symptoms and then recommending the surgery is fairly straightforward. Got it, got it. Well, and I know we've we've had a number of mutual patients and, yes. and I know yeah. your approach is very, it's very, a conservative, but very, very much proactively conservative. Yes. If, yeah, you, if, yeah, if you want yeah. to call it that. Yeah. Uh, so it is, um, if you do elect to do surgery, yeah. 
having taken uh, that into consideration, I know yeah. that that you use a number of different techniques. Yeah. So, and I know you do this with uh, sometimes uh, with uh, oncologists and and so on. Sure. Can you just just explore a yeah. couple of like gamma knife and SRS and yeah, so on and so absolutely. forth? Absolutely. Yeah, I think you know for most. So again, I think it helps to talk about the two different ent- the two different broad entities where we're talking about. Um, uh, tumors in the uh, that involve the bone, the spinal column, uh, the majority of which are metastatic. Um, we have definitely uh, leaned more towards conservative approaches for those patients. So mm-hmm. whereas, um, and, and it's really not that old uh, a philosophy, but whereas uh, once upon a time, and by that I'm saying within the past five, 10 years, and there are many practitioners of this still, if there was metastatic disease involving, uh, let's say, a vertebral body, uh, the inclination would be towards removing that body, mm-hmm. stabilizing that region with uh, basically a, a metallic titanium implant where the body was, mm-hmm. and then supplementing that with rods and screws to basically reconstruct the region that's been compromised by the tumor. Um, because of the advent of what you described, more targeted radiation, um, w- the field has really moved away from those more radical reconstructions. Because those construct- reconstructions involve lengthy operative times, lengthy recoveries, the, uh, the morbidity is collectively elevated and it really takes a toll on the patient physically. And so they might not even realize much in the way of a prognostic benefit, meaning Mm -hmm. extending life, or even functional benefit because they've just been so kind of knocked for that loop by the original operation. So we've become much more, um, you know, we've really taken a step back and we've approached these patients with, you know, a kinder, gentler philosophy, which is radiation alone, focused radiation, which now is, has become with some of these newer machines, more conformal so that the dose is just really hitting the tumor Mm -hmm. and at higher doses and still sparing the surrounding tissue. And so we're getting more long-term control of those entities. Um, And if the patients still need surgery, which a lot do, it's usually a combination of the radio surgery and the surgery, we can do this stuff through minimally invasive approaches, which really refers to the act of putting in rods and screws through small, essentially stab incisions on either side of the spine Mm -hmm. and using an array of things to guide those screws in, which uh, some of which include robots. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we've utilized at Robert Wood uh, in New Brunswick, as well as um, navigation uh, uh, systems, uh, the Medtronic O-arm being the one that we utilize, probably the most Mm -hmm. well-known and ubiquitous. So um, these provide tremendous accuracy, the blood loss is minimal, the hospitalizations reduce. I mean, these are dramatic, dramatic upgrades to the uh, kind of uh, original, more radical reconstructions. There is a role for those surgeries, but they've been fairly marginalized and really re- relegated to those uh, kinds of cancer, if you will, that don't really respond to radiation. And that's a very small subset now. Um, so, you know, we've 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 become more reasonable about it, less gung ho about these major reconstructions, and I think very much the patient benefit. Um, so yeah, that, and, yeah, and not, not to not yeah, to, no, to no, interrupt. Sure. Yeah, but, uh, in terms of the radiation, and yeah. in terms of these these aggressive um, surgeries, yeah, uh, there are a lot of things that even even they restore function. But part of uh, part of our training in rehab world was yeah. through like in our residency was through Sloan Kettering. Sure. And a lot of the times you see ten year post like post radiation fibrosis and, yeah. and and kind of the consequences of that, the quality of sure. life that it takes away, yeah. and then having to deal with that. Of course, the more the more focused treatments with yeah. minimally invasive would avoid a lot of these consequences that right. really catch up not immediately even like you like you said those those that are immediate are one thing but those that actually do end up going for a longer lifespan and 10 15 years later sure. then they're actually experiencing this post radiation fibrosis limitation and you're seeing a lot more long term survivors because of the advent of these new agents like immunotherapy as a mm-hmm. broad category and so Yeah, we are and going to continue to encounter more of the survivors that you've described that then have complications from the minimally invasive treatments that you know, have become more more popular managing this disease. Well, those were the ones that I'm talking about. Those were just global radiation. I mean, this is this is this is. So I'm talking 
10 years ago yeah. for people that have undergone this tre these treatments 10 years prior I, or 15 I, I years. You know, saying. so we're yeah. talking 20, 25 years yeah. ago where, where the radiation was more global. Right, and, I got it. And this was, this was, this was yeah, more, more conventional radiotherapy. More conventional radiotherapy, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Not, not the more not focused. The focus. yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I, I, no, I totally understand what you're saying. I mean, I think that... Um, you know, you could see the difference then in kind of what some of the long-term sequelae are of the more, uh, you know, the older technology versus the new. Um, but we are we are going to be dealing with people who are outliving the prognoses and, you know, um, are really going to be putting these new technologies that we have to the test because they're going to get these patients are going to be getting better systemic disease control, mm -hmm. meaning they are going to survive the cancer longer or perhaps uh, conquer it completely. Mm -hmm. um, and so then that's really going to, you know, is really going to put to the test, you know, how did that focused radiation do in the spine? I see. You know, does okay. this tumor recur? Or how is that instrumentation doing? Mm -hmm. You know, does it need to be revised? Does it need to be extended? Um, because these patients are going to be uh, living longer. So, um, I, I think also part of the reason why they're living longer when they have metastatic disease to the spine is uh, because we're not uh, putting them through the same level of operation and recovery. So, right. you know, it takes less of a physical toll. It's a hard thing to calculate. It's kind of a gestalt. But we know that putting people through less of an operation, less general anesthesia, less blood loss, it's probably a salubrious impact in terms of the patient's survival. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, well... Let's switch gears for a second, sure, right? Yeah. So, so let's talk. Like you said, this is not the most common thing that we right. see in the spine. Right. Um, primary tumors far less than the metastatic, and even the metastatic are not that common. Right. As far as generators of pain in the spine, or even in the general community, right? It's like how many people like that are going to walk into your office with back pain and have metastatic disease? It's uncommon. No, it's you uncommon. Know? It's Absolutely. uncommon in that general. In my world, obviously, it gets very. You know, it gets very filtered. But yeah, in general, what you're encountering or patients listening to this, you know, we don't want to dial up the freak out factor here. <laughs> right. I mean, the yes. odds of someone watching us having back pain, it turns out they have widely metastatic disease is low. Right. It's easily under 1% of people who complain of back pain. Perfect. Or so, neck pain, so, yeah. So then let's let's take your training, your focus on, on the minimally invasive therapies. Sure. And then... The more common entities, right? Yeah. The more common things that you that you would see causing low back pain, neck pain, yeah. causing or or more. Let's talk about radiculopathy or sure. stenosis, right? Yeah. So, how does someone like you, mm -hmm. having had that training in minimally invasive therapies, view? Well, let's let's look at it from from two perspectives. Number yeah. one, how do you view surgical interventions? Mm -hmm. You know, when do you consider surgical intervention? Yeah. And number two, what surgical interventions do you consider? having that prism of minimally invasive therapies. Yeah. So let's go first. Like when, yeah. what's, what's your surgical planning or, or decision-making in someone, sure. someone who presents, and we can talk about anything that, that, uh, that you want to take as an example of, yeah. let's say cervical stenosis or sure. cervical radiculopathy. In general, I'll say, I say that I'll say this here. I'll, I say this to my patients frequently, people who have pain overwhelmingly in the neck, People have pain overwhelmingly in the mid back, and obviously people have pain overwhelmingly in the low back. The operations out there, in my opinion, aren't great for that kind of symptomatology. Mm -hmm. Now that might sound a little nutty to people who are listening to this or who are seeking medical attention, because I think the equation for many patients and for care for clinicians is that if you have bad back pain and you try pain management with injections and therapy, then you necessarily qualify for surgery in that region. The reality is that is what happens the majority of the time. But I really think that the surgeries that we do in those regions for neck pain and for back pain don't work that well. The reason I believe that is I think most of the pain that people suffer from in the actual neck, mid back or low back is probably muscular. And when you're yeah. saying when you're saying that, uh, just to clarify, you're talking sure. about axial pain. Yes, right? so exactly. Pain that's confined to to the area and around the spine right. as opposed to pain that's radiating Correct. shooting into the extremities. Correct. Okay. It's a critical distinction to make because as a surgeon for me if someone presents with pain that's radiating down the arm or leg, to me, right out of the gate, that puts a person in a potentially surgical category. Mm -hmm. 
contrarily, if someone has pain in the neck or the back, I'm backing away. Now, that's different than a lot of the caregiver, a lot of the surgeons out there. Um, I'm just not a believer in the need for those operations for that kind of pain because I believe the overwhelming majority of that axial pain is muscular in nature, mm -hmm. potentially even psychogenic, okay. related to yeah. physical and emotional stressors. So I believe in things like activity modification. You know, if you're lifting a ton of weight at work and you avoid doing that, which is easier said than done for people whose livelihood depends on it, a lot of the pain will probably go away. And I don't want to get too tangential because there are a lot of various examples of that. Well, no, but, no, yeah. this, is, this is great because yeah. it's it's not a common conversation to be yeah, had with a surgeon, right? You know, to, to, to hear someone say about psychosomatic. And, yeah. uh, you know, so how do you feel about that in terms of, uh, in terms of having someone go to stress management. And, right, I'm a and, huge believer, which most surgeons aren't. I have, I had to institute, a lot of what I do now obviously is just oncology. Right. But when I had a little bit more of an open door to dealing with degenerative problems, I found it more common that someone would have pain that was wildly out of proportion to the MRI findings. Mm -hmm where I would classify the MRI as normal or age appropriate, and the patient would be in absolute agony. And when I would see that discrepancy, it was just an absolute no-brainer to not offer an operation. Mm -hmm. For me, right. the incentive structure for patients and primarily for surgeons to do these operations is too great. Mm -hmm. We've been Trap, not to get too, you know, polemical here, but we've okay. gotten very much into this world where, um, especially in this country, where we want a quick fix, where an epidural injection is viewed by many as a band aid, but the, but the surgery is the, is the cure. Right. Very few people take the long view. A lot of these surgeries beget additional surgeries. That's if the surgery is done well and doesn't have complications. And inherently, spine operations are a trade-off. So if someone actually does have true mechanical back pain, meaning that there's some degenerative problem in the lumbar spine that is leading to the pain, broken down facets, which are the joints, a disc that's broken down to the point where there's laxity and that motion, which is either macro motion that can be detected on dynamic x-rays or micro motion, which cannot, which we just speculate exists in that patient, that might respond to a fusion. Mm -hmm. The fusion is the act of basically putting in rods and screws and in many places re replacing the disc with an inner body to uh, immobilize that segment of the spine. The thinking being that there's abnormal motion, you put in this instrumentation, that motion goes away. But there's a built-in trade-off there, you lose some motion. Very few of these spine operations are, uh, uh, you know, just pure reward. There's something that has to be given up, surrendered by the, by the patient um, in order for it to work. And the principle of fusion is that you're sacrificing mobility for pain relief, right. which is if it's done properly is a trade anyone will take. But I don't think patients understand that concept that it's just, it's not all roses. Like there's going to be something, and that's if it works. Right. You know, I think a lot of back surgery, you know, back surgery in quotes has a bad name because of how indiscriminately the fusion operations are performed. And I think namely that's in the lumbar world. Mm -hmm. um, because getting in, getting in, you know, qualifying for a fusion is not getting into Harvard. It's you, you fail physical therapy, which right. maybe you're, you're half ass in your approach to it, or maybe there's a lot of variety among therapists in terms of their quality. You, you fail injections, and we know there's a lot of variety and quality among. You know, pain physicians, people call themselves pain physicians, some are fellowship trained, some are, you know, there's a whole world sure, of that. Sure, sure. Um, and maybe the injection is mistake, you know, someone thinks they got an injection, it was a trigger point injection, you know, it's, something, yeah. it's not a true epidural, it's not right. a facet block, what have you. And oral pain medications, which we know is a, is a hot button issue where, you know, most people I think now are trying to avoid that because of all the appropriate negative press. Right. All I'm saying is just easy to fail those modalities. Those are three modalities that are accepted. 
Um, and if you fail that, then technically, even by rigorous insurance standards, you can qualify for a fusion operation. So it's just fairly easy to qualify. And all along, you could have muscular pain, which is what I think a lot of it is. And, and I'm, I'm really glad that you're bringing all this up because this is, I mean, obviously in our world, in dealing with patients that are that are coming in and, and with pain and doing epidurals, I'll give you a number of examples where it's a mentality. It's a, yeah. it's it's that quick fix. It is yeah. that 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 aspect that fix me, do something for me, right. so that I am better, as opposed to taking control over their over of of their own health, right. if you will. And I yeah. know that you spend a lot of times with patients, uh, with patients discussing the, discussing and having them understand their uh, the anatomy and what is what is involved in sure. their pain generation. Yeah. And um, I know that because because some of the patients will come back and we'll discuss it and they'll they'll have gone over it <laughs> with you already. Yeah. And uh, some of the examples, some of the silly examples that I can give you are uh, a patient that comes in with a huge disc herniation on, a, on an MRI. Yeah. Uh, has failed physical therapy, and this is an MRI that was already obtained. Foot drop, and and really just in in a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. It looks like this is going to be a surgical case, um, and I should say dorsiflexion weakness, right? So so weakness weakness, and we do an epidural, and they're fifty percent better. Mm. They're actually the strength is better. Yeah, quickly. Yeah, great. We decide to do another epidural, mm-hmm. and they are they are seventy five percent better. Getting to physical therapy, more meaningful physical therapy Agreed. progress. Well said. More meaningful with with the pain relief. Yeah. yeah. So so then they're progressing. Now we uh, we finally do another epidural, mm-hmm. and this is a, a mo- one month follow up. Yeah. They are ninety five percent better yeah. as to their own assessment. Mm-hmm. Right. There is no perceived weakness. There is some patchy numbness, and they say that occasionally they'll they'll feel tingling. And this is actually a, a, a question that I yeah. am going to ask you, and perhaps this is not not the time to ask, but this is, this is more sure, about yeah. the mentality. Yeah. Um, and the question is, when should I see a surgeon? Yeah. And and my conversation and my take is, I don't know that anyone can can guarantee that that little bit of tingling is going to be taken away by surgery. Why not see how far, how much further we can take this? With with more with addressing without any deficits. Yeah. And this is this was these are a couple of only a couple of cases like this that I had yeah. that are surprising. You know, to yeah. me they were surprising because I didn't expect them to respond quite as well. But I do have these patients that insist on seeing a surgeon because they say that in the back of my mind I will always know that that disc herniation is there and I just want it fixed. And yeah, I mean, look, this is. I mean, I think you hit on a very interesting area. I mean, what I'll say is. Unfortunately, I think regard is a bit controversial, but it's, it shouldn't be. Most disc herniations heal. Mm-hmm. I mean, 80% of patients get better. So, um, and they don't just get better on their own necessarily, they get better with pain management, injections, and, and physical therapy. And I, you know, um, there are sometimes right out of the gate a horrific disc herniation that you will see that you can. Could, you know, you could speculate that probably won't heal because of the severity of the herniation and or the severity of the symptoms. And there, I do have cases like that where I do recommend upfront surgery, but the majority of the time, um, these disc herniations heal, they resorb. If you listen to surgeons talk about it, that's an alien concept. Um, the potential for healing is, is almost dismissed. Um, there are obvious cases, stenosis, the product of years of wear and tear, which is not a true acute or juicy herniation, where I think that healing potential is much less. Mm-hmm. Um, so I I view pain management in those cases as more than just um, a Band-Aid or a temporary thing. Because so, – so you mentioned about meaningful physical therapy. So one of the reasons I really advocate for pain management in particular is um, – in and of itself, an injection doesn't cure the herniation, but it can take the pain away from the nerve such that a patient can participate in physical therapy more meaningfully. Um, and it also just buys them more time to, to heal on their own. Right. Um, so that's the key. So that that's how I view it. I view it as a bridge. I view it as a bridge to healing. And that's how it's that's how it's successful. Oh, sometimes a patient will say, "Well, I got six months of relief and came back." Well, it wasn't that the injection lasted for six months. Absolutely. We know just physiologically it doesn't work that way. We know that the disc probably healed, mm-hmm. and then probably reherniated or bulged again. 
Um, and you know, some people love the concept or not necessarily love, but are, but are kind of wedded to the idea of surgery, fixing the disc. But then you have, when you get beyond the complications that can happen in the surgery, which albeit are few because they're relatively straightforward surgeries, but the disc is at higher risk for re-herniating after surgery than without an operation Mm -hmm. because you've disrupted the annulus, the lining of the disc. And you've disrupted the facet in order to, that's the joint, which you have to drill a portion of in order to access the disc, even in minimally invasive operations. So you've loosened that patient up and they're at more chance for herniating. Frankly, some people even psychologically may feel that because they've had the operation, they have more of a blank check to kind of re-engage in activities and go wild because the pain is gone. And maybe they'll even be a little bit more reserved about it if they never had an operation. Who knows? But the fact is, is that you're more likely to re-herniate if you've had the operation. Um, And so then you're talking about a second operation, which is definitely more challenging. Reoperative disc herniations are more difficult to deal with surgically Mm -hmm. because of the scar, because the adhesiveness of the surrounding, uh, the lining of the nerve and and that tissue. And then they're at risk for even herniating a third time. And then you're looking at, you know, pro athletes, Tiger Woods being a very well-known example of someone who ultimately had to undergo fusion. Mm -hmm. But just a little window into that world is, you know, fusions get recommended by surgeons with relative impunity, um, partly because that's just how surgeons have been conditioned in their training, part of it because of the mercenary angle, because they massively reimburse. Um, And so surgeons, therefore, are very inclined to perform these operations. But when you look at someone like Tiger Woods, as far as we know, and obviously the medical records are you know not public domain, sure, right. but he's had at least four discectomy operations before having a fusion, which is like no average person would have four attempts. And the reason they did, they were so worried about putting like some someone like that through a fusion. Mm-hmm. Why should the average Joe be any different? I know the average Joe is not winning the Masters, but the idea is that when it really mattered, right, when it really came down to this Tiger Woods and his career, Mm -hmm. they were very hesitant about putting him through a fusion. And they ultimately went anterior to do an even more minimally invasive style of approach to not disrupt any of the back tissue. So... You know, the, I, I went off on a little bit of a tangent there, but you know, you got to be, you got to be as a patient, um, you know, cognizant of that fact that, you know, you represent to a degree. This is somewhat sad, kind of uh, a money making proposition for some of these surgeons, and so, you know, you very well might need this operation, but it's the kind of thing where you have to just tread carefully. It's a very difficult operation to figure out who needs, I find. There are some slam dunk cases, the MRI, the CT, and the x-rays can really be indicative, but a lot of the cases would be considered borderline because in the end, the MRI is our best instrument for objectively determining the source of someone's pain, the pain generator, the term a lot of people like to use. Mm. And it's very hard to figure out what the true pain generator is. Right. Now, this has been looked at. A study that came out of Japan recently where, you know, whatever the number of patients were that were looked at with MRIs, a 1,000 patients or something, and an unbelievable number of these patients had what would be considered surgical MRIs but had no symptoms, right. had no back pain, had no leg pain. Right. Right. But the MRI didn't look good. The MRI looked bad. Right. And that's our best instrument. So correlating pain to an MRI finding remains an extremely elusive art and i i uh, this is a, a, a difficult conversation sometimes to have with patients for me because um a lot of times they want an mri where it doesn't look like an mri is going to reveal the pain generator right yeah. i mean someone doesn't have radicular pain they have axial pain not really radiating it does seem to be somewhat facet mediated right. to an extent muscle generated maybe discogenic but then we start talking about discogenic and talk about annular tear findings on an mri which yeah. are so non-consistent and and so like that high intensity zone that yeah. you see yeah. is really not it, yeah. it's it's so non-specific that you see these incidentally more so than you see them in in someone who has pain that is suspected totally. to have discogenic pain um so and, and so the way you describe epidurals and the way you describe all of this is, is exactly how how I describe it to patients. Yeah. I, I look at it as as a window of opportunity, yeah. right? And really it's 
in analogies and talking to patients, I really describe it. Look, think of this as there is a house that's on fire in your back. Mm -hmm. And right now, your best bet is to get the firefighters into that house to make an actual change. Yeah. That's physical therapy, yeah. right? Your boots on the ground is your exercises doing that. Sometimes you're not able to do that because just the mere, mere uh, attempt at getting into that house burns you because mm -hmm. of that inflammation. Mm -hmm. That's where I come in. Mm -hmm. That's where my fire fire extinguisher yeah. puts out that fire. Yeah. But, and this is this is uh, kind of the, the tricky part because sometimes I'll see patients on follow-up and we do one epidural, for instance, yeah. and they are 90 to 95% better. Great. Okay, have you started physical therapy? No, I'm, I'm doing great. No, this is terrible. This right. is exactly what you want to avoid because yeah. we just use the tool, which is a tool in the continuum of care, not a cure. This is, you need to to um, to address the ergonomics. You need to address work modification, totally. like you said. So all you of these- You gotta come at it from different angles simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah, just, yeah, I think a lot of people, if they get that injection, they feel better, they don't follow up therapy. I think you're right. I think you're, I think you're unique in that you're emphasizing the therapy to go along with the injection. I- believe in that strongly. I think that that's one of the advantages to really having an injection kind of around the same time that you have the therapy. So if you get some pain relief, you're then able to participate in the therapy more effectively Absolutely. and are more likely to get long-term relief and avoid an operation. And, and a more difficult aspect of this, and, and this is the conversation of the multifactorial aspect of the of back pain itself yeah. and talking about stress as part of this and psychological stress and psychosocial stress and so on. And talking about this, that it is a difficult number to place. I mean, is this 20% contributing to your pain? Is this 70% yeah, contributing? Great point. I mean, if you if you read Sarno's book, Love right, Sarno. His, yeah. Yeah, his, his point yeah. is it's all there. And um, yeah. Grant actually had a chance to interview Sarno and uh, and he clarified yeah. that point. Yeah. And he said, look, this we're not, I'm not saying that there is no anatomical or physiological reason for that pain, but yeah. in a lot of cases where there is no anatomical anomaly right. and people have, like you said, disproportionate yeah. amount of pain to the findings, right. clinical findings and and you know, imaging findings, there is a very strong psychological component no to this. And no so that's very hard for patients to hear because they they immediately believe that you don't that you don't believe their pain. Right. They're saying you that's think a, it's in my head. Right, right. That's a big put off or turn or however you want to phrase it. I mean it really it really can upset a patient and so I'm very careful about that. What I say is I, I, I it's not that I don't believe the pain, uh, but I just don't think it's coming from the spine. And it might be coming from the muscle. It might be a psychological thing. I mean, the pain is real. Pain, whether sure. it's actually from the spine or or not, it's perceived, you know, by the brain. You know, to say right. it in a very kind of vague way. And so, brain's a powerful thing. And so, thinking that you're in a lot of, you know, translating emotional, psychosocial stressors into pain, which the brain does, um, and Sarno writes about extensively. Um, I think that that accounts for a massive amount of the pain. I mean, Sorna also makes points that I, I mean, we do a disproportionate amount of spine surgery in this country on a per capita basis. So not mm -hmm. just comparing us uh, total numbers to Sweden or something, but per capita, it's unbelievable. It's over $30 billion a year on lumbar fusion alone, I think. The number's insane. Why do we do that more than any other country? Why are like 90, why do 90% of people at some point either miss work or seek uh, a clinical visit for back pain. Um, it's there's just something about the psyche mm -hmm. in this country that has translated stress or what we're dealing with on a regular basis, or maybe if there's something physical about our weight and our how how much we moved away from exercise, where we just have way more back pain than other countries where people are doing much more manual labor. Right. Kenya, who, how many people are getting fusions in these other countries? Very few. <laughs> sure. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, the complaints about it, and he even mentions that, I think he mentions Kenya, he mentions some African country where they just don't even right. see this stuff. So it's right. like, and usually they have caregivers who come from other countries, they're just floored by the amount of back pain. One of my, one of my uh, advanced practice providers, a nurse practitioner, and you can't believe the amount of back pain that she's just seeing. She's Pakistani by origin, but English. She's shocking amount of pain that it comes to the office. So, you know, there's an epidemic of this stuff and it gets in your head. I, I don't want to make it sound like it's too, like it's such a subliminal thing, but 
the laser spine institute and all these ads and all these you know get better it just it really has seeped into the collective consciousness i think of the country and i think people are way too attuned to back pain a friend who had back pain a friend who had surgery it just just filters in an early stage and like right, right. you have it it's like an almost an infection as opposed <laughs> to like a as opposed to like a, a, a structural condition so that's but but i'm probably i'm definitely outlier right, in, right. among <laughs> surgeons in that thought and, and a lot of us do with the fact that it's not the focus of my practice i mean i do it i do it very selectively but uh, that's part of why, what I like about oncology. It's kind of hard to argue with a big mass that's sitting in the canal. It's much easier to argue with a black disc on an MR, a dark disc on an MRI, a disc desiccation, annular tear, facet hypertrophy. Right. Yeah. You know, is that stuff really causing pain? It's very, a lot of times, no. Right. A lot of times, no. Yeah. Right. right. So and and then, of course, there's there are elements of, of all of this new research uh, that that's going into things like fibromyalgia and how oh, that yeah. escalates and how the neuromodulation and, and pathways are actually affecting. So then, then you get into the cycle of pain where totally. maybe there is a psychological component that then then kind of speeds up and and heightens the, the, the actual neurological. Yeah, I'll have people I look at in the office, I think they almost have like a pain syndrome. Right. Like right. whether it's fibromyalgia or something, they just have some heightened sensitivity to pain. Right. Psychological, I don't know. But I know that that sometimes accounts for why people have that disp- that lack of proportion between f- MRI findings and symptoms. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's part of a piece with a lot of what Sarna writes about. But it's also even been looked at clinically. You know, people with fibromyalgia, depression, do terrible with these operations. Sure, Horrible. Right, right. The success rate, and that's graded by their own satisfaction. So maybe there's some built-in bias there. But their satisfaction rate with their recovery, with how they've done, is, mm-hmm. is, is low. It's almost like a contraindication. To me, fibromyalgia is a contraindication when office appointment. <laughs> Forget that operation. <laughs> right, yes. You know, but fibromyalgia should be strongly weighed mm-hmm. by any surgeon who really cares about the outcome. See, that's the thing. We, a lot of surgeons are just divorced from the outcome. They don't really care about the outcome, as sad as it may sound. You do because you want yourself as a surgeon to have credibility in the community, the region, and, and at large. That you're doing good work and that patients are happy and patients are satisfied. And, but and, but you can get away from that easily. Yes, and, and the thing is that, so um, going away from, from a large tertiary care center and, and practicing in in sort of a community, although this yeah. is a large community, but right. it is a community environment. Um, uh, we're, we're lucky that a lot of the surgeons that we that we work with, yeah. they are in the community. They're community-based. So they are in integrated into the, into the community. They're not running away. They're not they're not seeing patients from miles away. Sure. You're somewhat unique in that in 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 that you are in a large center and yet you feel like you're part of the community and you are yeah, you are I mean, really integrated because I mean just to to say that just recently I received an email from you about as a follow-up with one of the patients that I referred to you four years ago who yeah. you saw on follow-up. And yeah. so you stay connected, you stay very much integrated sure. in patients' care in and in the within the community community both locally and also within the medical community, uh, keeping everyone abreast of of progress and 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 so on. But some of the surgeons that are practicing in in the perhaps in the ivory tower yeah. and and yeah. they are seeing patients that they will never see again because yeah. they flew in um some of the patients that fly off to florida to yeah. have surgery and then yeah. they're, they're, yeah, that's a whole crazy phenomenon that yeah right right um well so we've we've gone away from from the surgical aspect yeah. and important this yeah. is an important part to talk about because yeah. this is definitely part of of decision making right sure. surgical decision making in a sense of perhaps this is the surgical decision to not do surgery which right. is yeah. as important if not more important than to do surgery well right? said yeah so let's talk about the cases that are appropriate for yeah, surgery sure so let's take cervical spine yeah. the neck right yeah. what type of approaches do you take f- uh, with let's Take for for instance, do you take a different approach with someone who has that juicy herniated disc? Yeah. And when I say that, what I yeah. what I mean is essentially otherwise age appropriate spine. Yeah. Here's there there is a large disc herniation. Yeah. Someone who has failed conservative care in sure. many different ways and has radicular symptoms. In yeah. other words, symptoms that are going radiating into the arm. Yeah. Perhaps with some deficits, numbness, and weakness. What type of approaches do you look at? What what type of things do you 
do you look at and what do you like to, to yeah. do? I would say that in general, the patient you described there, so someone has a big disc herniation and symptoms involving pain and or numbness or even weakness radiating down an arm. Those are the patients who are really the closest we get to a slam dunk in terms of surgery helping. Mm -hmm. um, it's really what I would call kind of a textbook case where you see a disc herniation at a certain level, contacting the root on an MRI, and the patient having symptoms clearly referable to that. Mm -hmm. Those are cases I like because I think the likelihood of a good outcome is high. Sure. And so in general, um, I, and I think a lot of surgeons would agree with this, like to approach those discs through the front of the neck, what we refer to as an anterior approach. Mm -hmm. It may sound exotic, but it's actually extremely common. Um, and, you know, to go back to the kind of athlete picture, so any of these NFL players in particular, but also baseball players who have had disc injuries, it's all been anterior approaches because that is um, the more, I, I would say, physiologic, a little bit more natural because you're just going through tissue planes in the neck mm -hmm. um, as opposed to a lot of the muscle splitting that happens when you come from the back of the neck. So those are the two general approaches, anterior and posterior, front or back, mm -hmm. rarely both, but that's also in play. Um, so I just find that there's less pain, less long-term discomfort and stiffness when you come through the front of the neck. And it also identifies the pathology directly because you're actually removing the disc. That's a very general, broad kind of categorization. Um, in the younger patients, uh, and in patients who don't have gross instability, meaning laxity, which can mm -hmm. cause some true neck pain, I do think that the disc replacement operation, which is really identical to the cervical fusion operation, just with the uh, just at the end of the operation, it's a different implant that goes into the disc space. Mm -hmm. So whereas with fusion, you remove the disc and you put in a spacer that has bone substitute, um, and through that spacer, the patient will generate their own bone growth, and that's what constitutes the term fusion. Instead of that, you, you you instead of that construct, you put in basically a hard piece of plastic with a little bit of titanium that simulates the disc. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that the patient doesn't have as much stiffness, preserves range of motion, less likely to break down the levels that are next to the the level that you operated on. Mm -hmm. And so it's 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 a very appealing option, I think, in a lot of those situations. Um, fusion is it is a little bit of a gilding the lily phenomenon because fusion is very tried and true and successful. I mean, the success rates of fusion and patient satisfaction, cervical, mm -hmm. the anterior cervical operation are through the roof, easily above ninety percent, and kind of what I just described. So. But I, you know, I do think that the disc replacement, I'm a fan of it, and I think it has uh, an expanding role, and it probably will continue to, and patients also are very inclined towards it because of the idea of this preserved motion and not needing future surgery. So um, I wouldn't say that it constitutes necessarily a minimally invasive approach, but I would say that um, it's just a little bit more technologically advanced because these these disc replacements are newer implants but the fusion also has new new implants too it the field evolves rapidly and constantly because there's just a lot of money in it mm, yeah. and so there's a lot of industry interest in fine-tuning tweaking newest thing on the market kind of thing i usually reserve these posterior operations for when people have much more extensive breakdown three or more levels of disc involvement or more than that. That's usually when I'm considering the posterior approach. And is that because it's not reasonable to replace multiple discs? Yeah, so the FDA doesn't even has not even approved disc replacement for more than two levels. Even two levels is somewhat new. I see. So you can't do more than two levels of disc replacement, but you can do four, even five levels or some crazy circumstances like that of fusion from the mm -hmm. front. But it's just a lot my own bar is three levels. A lot of people are more than willing to do four levels from the front. So I, I, I just think what becomes what I th classified initially to you here as kind of a comfortable 
uh, less, uh, you know, less neck stiffening operation becomes that I feel when you go above the three levels. And I don't, also don't particularly love doing three levels either. Um, I think it's relatively uncommon to need to do that, but it, it gets done a lot. Do you ever see a combination of those two things? The front and the back? You no, mean, no, uh, I mean uh, disc replacement and the fusion. You do, but it's it's a little, uh, they're kind of unique, awkward circumstances. I think if um, it's probably not done at the same time. Right. It's probably someone had a prior fusion and then, you know, is being reoperated on and the person might try disc replacement. Is that, do you see more success with disc replacements in the cervical spine as opposed to the lumbar? Yeah, see, so the lumbar spine is, uh, the lumbar spine disc replacements have been fraught with a lot of issues. I mean, I, I couldn't even tell you right now if there is an FDA approved disc replacement in the lumbar spine. It's approved in Europe. Mm -hmm. And the the technology did come over here, but in a limited way, and there were issues with the implants. So it's also a bigger operation to get that disc replacement. And see the, see, the disc replacement of the cervical spine is, like I was saying, just at the end of the operation, it's just a different implant compared to fusion. Mm -hmm. Whereas disc replacement of the lumbar spine really requires a big opening, it requires this the same approach that Tiger Woods had. It's an anterior, anterior approach. Mm -hmm. So even though it is a little bit minimal, it's still you need an approach surgeon, you need someone to mobilize the abdominal contents, it's typically best at L5-S1. Okay. You get into some issues when you're a little bit higher than that. So disc replacements haven't really taken off for the lumbar spine. I'm not saying they don't have potential. I'm just not such an expert in that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it has appeal because there's so much fusion work going on in the lumbar spine. It does everyone need to be fused like that? Uh, you know, the answer, the answer to me is a resounding no. But I'm not saying that those people necessarily even need disc replacements. They probably don't right. need much of anything. Right, right. You know, right. so, um, but yeah, for the cervical spine, the data is compelling. Um, European data and, and obviously the aggregate of what's happening here in the States. And, um, and of course, the, the thought of preservation of the range of motion is goes back to what we were talking about in, in the context of spine tumors, right? Yeah. Because a lot, of the people's, a lot of the people are going to survive some of the, some of the cancer diagnoses, but sure. also people that are suffering with these disc herniations or some degenerative processes are going to end up living longer just in general. Yes, so, yes. so some of that adjacent segment disease, Correct. Right, the, the adjacent segment degenerative disease is more of a concern because because that's going to play yeah, a role. Exactly. I mean, no one really has a great number. So when someone gets a fusion in the cervical spine and similar to the lumbar spine, no one knows the exact number or the likelihood, the percent chance of the level that's right next to where you fuse breaking down. Mm -hmm. um, it's been looked at. There's some famous studies that have looked at it. The best estimate people have is probably between two to four percent per year. Mm -hmm. that a level next to the fuse level will break down. So if you're diffusing someone in their 40s and they live to 75, that's 30 plus years of 2 to 4% per year. So one would think that is likely that person will need uh, an operation to address the adjacent segment. So, Which usually is an extension of the... Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right. There are other ways now to kind of get around. There's minimally invasive technology that I've utilized, though rarely, but not because I don't think it could be more widely applied. It's just not so much my practice now, but particularly in the cervical spine where you can put in um, uh, little cages into the joints. The system is called D-TRAX, D-T-R-A-X. Mm -hmm. It's by Providence Medical, and you can put in these little cages into the joints, and it helps to open up room around the nerve roots because the the joints often, as part of why nerves get compressed, get collapsed. Um, or they're just collapsed a little bit, and by putting that cage in to the facet, it opens up room around the nerve that's being compressed by the disc, for example. And so that's an, an operation that takes about an hour. It is done under general anesthesia, but the patients can go home the same day. But my patients go home the same day from the anterior approaches as well. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, you know, there are, there are these alternatives that are springing up for dealing with um, either upfront pathology or um, the, the, the long term sequelae of the initial operation. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily in answering your question, having to go back in through the same incision or having to take, you know, take the rod down and, and do, you know, there are ways, 
you know, for example, an operation that, that I do, that I am a huge believer in because I, I think just the results have been great anecdotally for me and, and of course, in the literature, is a lateral fusion. So that's for lumbar, mm-hmm. where you avoid coming through the back specifically and develop more natural planes between the muscles in the, in the flank region okay. and can access the side of the spinal column that way and can remove more of the disc that way and can get a bigger implant in that way. And I found that that has been a much more well-tolerated operation. Well, for tolerated in terms fusion. of recovery? Yeah, or? recovery is like a day in the hospital, way less post-operative pain um, and success in treating the original symptoms. Um, but it, you know, it has a very good role, for example, if someone's had a prior fusion and then they have an adjacent segment problem and you don't have to address the prior construct at all. You could just put in one of these cages from the side. Do you see this approach being becoming more? It has. I mean, I just, I just, I'm a big fan of it in general, uh-huh. but I don't see a lot of the patients who probably could benefit because a lot of the patients have had prior fusions and I tend not to want to get involved mm-hmm. in those cases for, you know, for because it's not so much what I focus on now. But, you know, the utility of that approach is is it's very hard to argue with it. I've seen very good results with that, again, both up front and for people who've had prior surgery. Interesting. Yeah. Um, let me ask you a slightly slightly different question sure this the the minimally invasive approach yeah. is yeah. something that that gets thrown around a lot right yeah. um how do you define that i mean yeah. where, where do you draw the line of something that's minimally invasive versus something that is that is considered to be more aggressive or more traditionally open surgery yeah, if you, it, yeah it definitely is an overutilized term because the marketing appeal is great you sure. know when patients hear it and i think the laser spine institute before it went belly up were really masters at uh, kind of invading the public consciousness with this whole idea of you know the band-aid after the operation yes. Right, and just the one, you know, going home the same day, and a lot of it was total garbage because they just really didn't do a lot in these cases. They just probably just looked in, didn't really do much at all. No one really knows, except for the people who were performing the operations. You know, they were they were proprietary about it and very and very um, very private as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of appeal to it because people don't want to undergo these big operations. Um, for me, I would say I definitely think there's some relevance to the term. I definitely think it still means something. Right. Um, I think it's just for me, it's just it's just as simple as when I'm using a smaller incision. Okay. You know, that's kind of what it is. And the smaller incision, by definition, means less muscle splitting or take down and and less manipulation of the of the soft tissue mm-hmm. in order to get to the uh spot to, to the to the region of the spine the lateral fusion i just described would i think accurately be classified as minimally invasive because it does involve a smaller incision and it does involve less muscle split mm-hmm. and muscle damage in a more traditional incision in the back um there's less of a you know, so much of what we do cervical is fairly minimal to begin with, especially anterior. Mm-hmm. But for example, that cage that I was describing that goes into the joint known as the facet in the cervical spine, that would be considered minimally invasive. There are two little stab incisions that accommodate that kind of cage. So for me, it's just, it is it is kind of what you would think the term means, just smaller incisions, less muscle and tissue manipulation, and therefore, Probably, not necessarily initially, but as you get better at it, shorter operative times, Mm -hmm. no question less blood loss, no question less post-operative pain. And so it translates in a lot of these cases into a faster recovery. And and I think in talking about less operative time, it's... It, I think it's important to to mention for our listeners. I mean, why is that important? Yeah. I mean, what what what's involved? I mean, from anesthesia yeah. to yeah, the general. I mean, a lot of what else to say. And a great question. No one really has a great answer for it. I would say that we know that general anesthesia isn't healthy. So the idea of being under general anesthesia for a shorter period of time is a good one. Five, ten minutes. What does it matter? But if you're shaving a couple hours off an operation, probably matters. Probably matters for elderly too. Sure. And obviously, if you're talking about some of these bigger reconstructions that you could avoid and do minimally invasive, 
you know, trying to, if you're able to avoid giving a patient a transfusion, which is uncommon to begin with, but that also can be an unhealthy thing. I think we underrate how unhealthy a transfusion can be. I'm not talking about contracting HIV or something, but the reactions that can be had and there are other medical complications that can unfold. And so I do think that less general anesthesia exposure time, uh, less of a pain requirement. So you're not taking these narcotics, you're not uh, slowing your recovery cognitively, physically, you know, and that all the downstream consequences of these narcotics of getting constipated. It just allows you to potentially have a more organic, natural recovery to the operation. And probably for that reason is just more globally healthy. Mm-hmm. But it's hard to really point out a very specific, you know, equation of one plus one equals two. It's just sure. in general, like it's probably better for those reasons. Right. And, yeah. and that's that's really what where I was what I was asking because yeah. because this is this is also something that sometimes gets thrown around and and um, for our listeners to understand why why you mentioned that yeah. because there are many variables that go into it and and that's why you place a value on that yeah. as, as one of the outcomes. Yeah, when I have a patient in my office who want, you know, I know he needs a spine tumor removed, I'll get a lot of this. Can you do it minimally invasively in them? There are some options for that, but it's like there's certain times where the operation in its current form, it shouldn't really be tinkered with. You know, some of these tumors we're dealing with are large. You need mm-hmm. the exposure. Right. Right. And sometimes, you know, but I do think in the degenerative world, there's a great role for it. The spine tumor world a little bit less, but it's growing. Mm-hmm. Laser technology, for example, for tumors is something that's done in very few places. We haven't adopted it fully yet um, at Robert Wood, but it's something that, um, you know, will probably have more of a role uh, for that kind of thing. We already talked about radio surgery. Right. There are other forms of ablative technology, osteocool, which is something I haven't used yet, but it's something that... Um, uh, Medtronic offers for treating some uh, bony cancer and, and, and epidural disease, meaning right next to the bone and in the mm. space around the lining of the spinal canal. So, what, what is that technique? Yeah, it's basically a way. It's a way of um, uh, of injecting uh, through a, through a catheter uh, a cooling agent that's supposed to basically cryoablate, you know, basically freeze mm-hmm. some tumor and it's and basically either shrink it or prevent it from growing further. So uh, for tumors that have been irradiated and continue to grow, uh, for tumors that, um, you know, have had prior surgery and the radiation, you know, I think that these are uh, candidates for this kind of thing. We don't want to go back in and necessarily uh, do another operation. The wound healing can be difficult. The damage to the surrounding tissue can be more difficult to control. So there's 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 a lot of the there's a lot of interest in this, and and this this is a good segue into what I was going to ask you as far as what's on the horizon for surgery for for spine surgery you know and and I know you've mentioned a couple of things and um, and I guess this is this is also a two part question because yeah. the one question is what do you see on the horizon for oncological neuro neuro oncology uh, type of surgery and does that in any way translate into degenerative disease because yeah. a lot of the times you know the the oncological world has produced a number of different different entities and, and remedies and techniques that have entered into into the the, the more common degenerative yeah, world great, yeah, yeah. so, so what, what do you what do you see yeah i mean look i think the goal of a lot of these newer technologies is a goal in a way that doesn't sit well with surgeons because ultimately you want people who don't even need an operation, you know? So does radiation end up taking the lead? Does some medical therapy, not necessarily chemotherapy, but do, you know, that that's probably the real ultimate goal in future where these things can be controlled. These tumors can be controlled without any operation. Um, But short of that, and I, I don't think any of that's really that close. It's of a piece with what we were discussing. It's just smaller approaches, Mm -hmm. better optics, um, you know, better instruments. Um, I don't foresee kind of whole scale paradigm shifts outside of surgery just being phased out in, you know, in some theoretical future. Um, 
But I see it, I see variations on those kinds of themes, some of which we're already seeing, you know, exoscopes, for example. Uh -huh. So basically the optics of these kinds of new microscopes, which were not looking through the eyepiece anymore and down into the tumor, but we were looking up on a high definition flat screen and the scope that comes in is just a, a small entity mm -hmm. that um, has incredible definition and we're operating looking up as opposed to looking through eyepieces. So not only do you get better optics, but it's better ergonomics for you as a surgeon. You can see the tissue better. Um, so those kinds of things are just going to continue to improve. So they're very so just actually making the surgery more effective. We see with brain tumors now uh, the ability. So uh, this is a bit different than than spine tumors, with the exception of tumors that are in the spinal cord itself. Mm -hmm. But tumors in the brain itself can sometimes be difficult to distinguish from normal brain. Um, and so. Fluorescence, which is relatively recently approved here in the States, is an oral compound that people will drink hours before the operation that selectively hybridizes to tumor tissue. And so when a microscope with a specific filter is brought in, you see the tissue, you see the tumor tissue. It lights up, it looks different. So it makes your removal easier. So, um, you know, the, there will probably be a version of that for tumors in the spinal cord. But that's rare. Those are very rare entities. Mm -hmm. um, but they're going to be, you know, they're going to be, I think, that that I would put into the optics category. And so I think overall optics and our ability to visualize is going to be improved. And I think, therefore, as we improve that, we could probably do things through even smaller incisions, less painful incisions, um, that kind of thing. But there probably will be a day where you, similar to what I was describing with the laser, you probably... There'll be a day where you put a probe in and it shrinks the tumor, you know, or you or you put an ultrasound device on the back and it shrinks. Probably crazy stuff, but that's really, you know, futuristic. Still, yes, there's yeah. still a couple of leaps away from oh, that. Yeah, yeah. And they probably will look at that current day medicine as medieval. Yeah, right, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, the idea of like doing a laminectomy and opening the dirt or remove a tumor will be archaic. Right, right. But, but that operation has existed really since the, the teens, since the 20s, mm -hmm. at least over 100 years old where you would perform that kind of surgery to remove the bone at the back of the canal and open up the dura and then remove uh, the mass. Um, obviously the success rate's dramatically better, almost needless to say, but you know, so will there be a role for that in 50 years? Who knows? I don't think that particular operation has changed a whole lot over the past 20, 25 years. The techniques are relatively similar. It's um, the ability to monitor, so reduce neurologic injury from mm -hmm. our ability to monitor the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. That has definitely improved and changed rather dramatically. Um, you know, for example, if I, have a, if I have a mass in the spinal cord itself, we now utilize what are called D waves, which um, provides us with continuous motor monitoring. Whereas traditionally, and still in many cases that, that we do, cranial and also spinal, you have to ask for a motor to be performed by the physiologist who's sitting in the room because it's done transcranial and can't be done continuous, it's done intermittently. But so you don't you're not calling for those every minute, you're calling for those every few minutes at most. And so the idea behind that ability to monitor is you're seeing continuous and whether or not you're damaging the tissue in real time. Mm -hmm. so it's a relatively new thing, the D-Wave. So I think our ability to see, our ability to monitor, those are the immediate things on the horizon and in the long term, you know, there'll be ways in which we're avoiding surgery altogether. Right. Star Trek. Yeah, right? exactly. exactly. <laughs> um, all right. So let's mm, change gears a little bit. Yeah. And let me ask you this question. Yeah. A lot of misconceptions about the world of spine surgery yeah. in general maybe neurosurgery as well, to some extent. What is the most common misconception that, that you hear about your, your specialty? Yeah, it's a tough question in that, and we were kind of talking about this before. Um, you know, a lot of my, a lot of the misconceptions or wrong information or fake news, I think has to do with a lot of the, the lumbar surgery that's done, so back surgery that's done. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think it's not just any one thing, but I think it's a collective, you know, the misconceptions are, and this is a little bit different than what I said, you know, back surgery is bad or um, these big kind of generalizations, which 
there is some truth to it. But, you know, I think as a patient, you got to kind of uh, take a little bit of a deeper dive. These operations are different from patient to patient. So my, my cousin had back surgery. Did he have an L1 to S1 fusion? Uh, did he have a discectomy? Right. You know what I mean? And I think a lot of misconceptions arise from family members or friends of prospective patients that have undergone what they on the surface believe are the same operation, but in reality are altogether different surgeries. And so they're allowing themselves to get informed by the experience of others when it's dramatically different. Right. And so I guess you can classify that as a misconception. Um I look at it more as a just a world you got to traffic in and travel within. You got to tread carefully mm -hmm. um, because the incentive is great for surgeons to do the operations. And the patients, unfortunately, unwittingly, are very willing subjects because the pain can overwhelm and dominate their existence and whittle away their quality of life. They want a solution. Mm -hmm. So if, if we could say that the misconception is exactly the opposite of what I just said, that back surgery therefore is great, is a cure, mm -hmm. that has to be examined more closely by the patient. Because as I said, even if you get beyond the immediate complications of surgery, there are quite a few of pe people who undergo surgery who, A, it doesn't work for, or B, at some point in the future, it needs to be revised. So it should not be viewed as a cure, a panacea, a final end point. You have to understand that it very well could precipitate new problems. And so I personally am a fan of what you do, of what the non-operative methods uh, you know, hold that promise that it holds for patients. Even psychologically, I think it's meaningful for a patient to feel that they've exhausted everything before doing surgery. I do think that patients sometimes feel they had their arm twisted or that they jumped in. Okay. So I think that the misconception, you know, I think that, you know, the misconception that surgery is a curative thing mm -hmm. is a dangerous misconception. Um, so, you know, it's just, you just have to examine that a little bit closely as a patient. But like I've said, I also have patients who have a lot of trepidation about it. Yeah. But, and I also think therefore there are the, the misconceptions of, uh, you know, of what quote unquote back surgery is can be a little bit dangerous too. Even for patients who have done well, mm -hmm. not necessarily just the horror stories of friends and family who have done poorly. You have to sift through it a little bit more because there are major differences in these operations. They range from outpatient procedures that can be safely performed at surgery centers to massive five to seven hour reconstructive operations or even more for people with deformity and other kinds of you know, scoliosis and other kinds of major structural issues. Right. So it's a very apples to oranges situation a lot of the time. Yeah, and, and and whenever whenever conversation about surgery comes up uh, with my patients, usually my recommendation is you have to talk to the surgeon. I am sure, not yeah. the right person to to talk about and answer questions about is surgery appropriate. Right. And I can certainly say that this this is this is an appropriate referral for to a surgeon, yeah. but also there are questions about what's my recovery going to be like. What can I expect? What should I expect? Yeah. Because I, I, I say exactly that, that even, even if we are thinking that this is the segment of the spine that needs to be addressed, I cannot predict nor say what approach right. a surgeon would take and therefore that will yeah, dictate. In similar fashion, I'm deferential to what, you know, when, when I recommend pain management, you know, pa patients have a lot of questions about that. Where are they gonna target? What's in the, what's in the injection? Right, right. I'll try to fill in a few blanks, but I'll definitely you know, provide the caveat that I'm not the person doing it. You got to talk to that person. Right. But I really genuinely believe that it's just, uh, I almost will say it, it is like basically a literal mosquito bite compared to the operation. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what it is. So you just, you know, people who, you know, I'll have, a pa I'll have patients, it's actually a decent percent who are more freaked out by the, by the fact that a needle will go into the back or neck than they are about a surgery. It's, it's a bizarre phobia because the surgery is so much more 
involved. Right. I, I'm talking about like physically, not necessarily technically, but the physical involvement, it, it just supersedes in a needle placement so dramatically. But some patients are very hung up on that. I guess that could also be classified as misconception too. Right. right. You know? Um, well, then let me ask you this. Yeah. So if you yourself... If you were looking for a surgeon, yeah. right? And this is, of course, for our listeners that that are listening from afar and that need to talk to a surgeon. Yeah. If you were looking for a surgeon for yourself or for your family, what kind of questions would you ask that yeah. surgeon? Yeah, um, you know, I think a lot of the questions that I get from the patients in this region are the some of the questions that I would ask. These are informed people, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you don't love it necessarily as a surgeon getting the question. How many of these have you done? Sure. Um, you know, what's the focus of your practice kind of thing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, w you know, would you have this done if it were you? I think it's very relevant in the degenerative spine world because I really don't believe a lot of the surgeons who recommend the surgeries would allow it to be done to them. Okay. I really don't believe that. Interesting. When I see these three or four level fusions being done, I think there's no way in hell these guys would say, I, I want that for myself. Okay. <laughs> there's no way. I don't, and, 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 but, but I mean, and I, I'm also speaking from someone who's, who has good, good, good outcomes with some of those operations. Sure. No, I understand that. You yeah. know, so it's not even like I'm seeing just bad out. I mean, I'm not. I'm seeing a good outcome, but it's like, it is hard on people. Oh, well, and sometimes the, the answer would be yes, right? Yeah. Uh, because they may want that given... Given, given, they may they say, "Hey, if I had your pain or something right. like that, right?" Or, or maybe, maybe in terms of in terms of anatomy and in terms of what what. Yeah, that I don't want to say is. all these guys are peddling operations that they wouldn't necessarily engage. No, I, I but I do, th it. I do think there's a lot of that's not. There's always that disconnect. It's not me. You're making sure. the recommendations to someone else. You're not the one taking the plunge. Right. So I don't know. I, I look at a lot of these cases and say, "There's no way I'd want that done for myself." But also, I'm not sitting there in agony. Right. right. Um, so, but some of those are some of the questions. You know, kind of, how many have you done? Would you do this if this were you? Um, you know, also, I, you know, I love the private practice world. Genuinely, it's a big part of me that that you know, I'm a, I'm a capitalist. I'm into what you know, the opportunities making. It. And I think that there's a lot of encroachment from the hospitals into the private sphere because it's hard to practice independently. And, and it's a bit of a, you know, a bit of a regime, bit of a takeover. You know, you have to answer these big entities now. These administrators are often get paid more than you and, you know, maybe got an online degree and you've slaved away at all these quality institutions. And they're telling you what instruments to use, what you can do, what you can do. That's kind of healthcare. So I really do value the private sphere. But I do think that when it comes to something, if you're getting a, a complicated operation getting recommended to you, it probably behoove you to consider having a recommendation from someone in an academic place because the incentive tends to be less for the operation, the financial incentive for the mm -hmm. surgeon, than if you're in pure or private practice. But I don't want to dismiss that private world because a lot of times in the private world, you're getting tremendous attention, focus in the academic world. You could slip through a little bit. Um, it can be a little bit more of a factory. But but some of these some of these criticisms can be leveled on both sides. Absolutely. So it's a, a little bit of a tough question to answer. There's no, it's it's a good question, but there's not a great uh, I don't have a great answer for it. You right. know? And I, I don't know that one exists, right? I mean, if, yeah. if someone was to ask me that regarding pain management, I don't know that I would have a, a kind of a unifying right. question that, that would that would qualify or disqualify someone. It is it is it involves You think about getting other opinions. I mean, yeah. I don't you know, we don't love that as surgeons necessarily. Um, also depends on the quality of the opinion, who you're going to. But if God forbid I had some complicated problem that was in my own sphere mm -hmm. or was for someone in my family. Just like when I have a difficult case, I show it to a couple people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But sometimes as a patient, you can get very turned around by that, and it, it depends on your personality. So when patients ask me whether or not to get a second opinion, I have different thoughts on it. It depends a little bit on your personality. Uh, you know, if you're if you're malleable and you're pliable and you're anxious, it might be bad because you might get different opinions that spin you around and you get kind of pulled away from doing what is prob what what is probably a right thing. But for other people who can kind of sift through the information and process it according, it might be very helpful to validate. It, it varies. It's a personality thing. Sure, sure. No, absolutely. 
Um, Simon, this has been a great conversation. Is yes. there anything anything else you want to add? No, I would say it was a comprehensive discussion, no doubt about that. Yeah, I just want to be respectful of your time because yeah. you are here uh, after having covered surgery in the morning, and yes. then you may have a case later, uh, Later, so I appreciate you being here. Yeah. Uh, so thank you. It's a you. lumbar fusion. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Simon, thank you very yeah. much. Thanks for your time. Sure. Appreciate it.